Erev Tov, good evening. We are going to continue the Rambam class that we began last night, discussing the role of the Anshe Kness, the Gedona, in Am Yisrael. If you have the source sheet in front of you, uh, we are going to be using that source sheet tonight. I attached it as a PDF to the Google Classroom uh, and the Zoom invitation that I sent out earlier today. Um, Tell you what page you'll be on in just a moment. I ended off telling you that our rabbis taught us the following thing. On page six in Baba Batran, Amar Rabbi Avdimi, Rabbi Avdimi says, Rabbi Avdimi of Chefa says, they claim to have his grave today in Chefa, I'm not sure. From the day that the Ben Mikdash was destroyed, the prophecy was taken away from the prophets. And was given to the sages, the Chachamim. Are you trying to tell me that a Chacham is unable to be a prophet? Meaning, are you saying that Chachamim and Nevi'im are mutually exclusive? Hachikamar, this is what he means to say, What it intends to say, what Rabbi Abdimi intended to teach us was, that even though the Nivu'ah was taken away from the Nivi'im, the Nivu'ah was not taken away from the Chachamim. That's the meaning of this teaching. So the Nivi'im ceased prophesying, but our Chachamim did not cease to be connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. In Baba Batra it continues, Amar Amemar, Amemar said, V'chacham adif minavi, not only can a Chacham be a Navi, and not only did the Nevi'im stop prophesying, whereas the Chachamim continued, but more than that, if you would ask us to choose who is greater than who, a Chacham is greater than a Navi, a sage is greater, preferable to a prophet. Shneemar, like it says, okay, this is relevant, not to us. Let's look on page 7. Amar le'e Rav, Shemen bar Abba le'Rabbi Yochanan. Rav Shemen tells Rabbi Yochanan, מכדי, מכדי, אנשי כנסת הגדולה תיקנו להם לישראל ברכות ותפילות, קדושות והבדלות. We mentioned that אנשי כנסת הגדולה began instituting things in the Jewish people. Well, the first mention we have in מסכת ברכות is that אנשי כנסת הגדולה, they enacted a few things, blessings, ברכות, תפילות, prayers, קדושות, sanctifications, and הבדלות. And from here you see that our rabbis came along, and this group of Chachamim, and they standardized tefillah, they turned it into blessings. What exactly happened? Let's look at the Rambam together. The Rambam writes, in the Mishneh Torah, on page 7, in Hilchot Tefillah, Berkat Kohanim, chapter 1, Halacha 1. The Rambam is very beautiful in that he always gives us introductions to what he's going to tell us. And this introduction itself is, is codification of law, but it explains to us also the evolution of the law until it reaches where we're at right now. Says the Rambam, Mitzvat aseh bechol yom. It's a mitzvah, an active commandment. I, don't, I prefer not to use the words positive and negative commandments. There are no negative mitzvot. Active and passive mitzvot, perhaps. Mitzvat aseh, it's a active commandment lehitpalel b'chol yom to pray every day. Shneemar, like it says, v'avadetem et Adonai Elohechem, and you shall serve Hashem your God. Mipi ha-shemua lamedu sh'avodah zo hi tefila. According to the shemua, according to our rabbinic tradition, it tells us that this service, how do you serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Through tefila. We say that every day. What does it mean? To serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu with all your heart? 
אמרו חכמים, איזו היא עבודה שבלב, זו תפילה. What is עבודה שבלב? What is the service of the heart? The service of the heart is תפילה. So we know that there is a biblical requirement to pray every single day. So what is unique then about the Knesset HaGadolah? What are they doing here? ואין מניין התפילות מן התורה. The number of prayers is not written for us in the Torah. ואין משנה התפילה הזאת מן התורה. And the form of this תפילה, the, the way in which we pray, the formulas which we use to pray, are not in the Torah. ואין לתפילה זמן קבוע מן התורה. Says the Rambam that according to the Torah, there's also no set time for prayer. So yes, we know the different forefathers prayed at different times of the day. We know the different forefathers and foremothers of ours used different tefillot and formulas of tefillah. We also know that altogether our forefathers may have prayed three tefillot a day. But none of this is required or mentioned explicitly in the Torah that that is exactly the way that we're supposed to pray. What we know today of three tefillot a day in a certain type of formula Uh, with the specific prayers and set times to pray Shacharit, set times in which you could pray Mincha, set times in which you can recite Kiryat Shema and Arvit. All of these are later institutions of Am Yisrael, but not originally the way in which the Torah prescribes prayer. It's for that specific reason, in the bottom of page 7, the Ramam continues on Halakha Bet, Nashim v'avadim chayavin b'tfila, that Women and slaves are obligated in the tefillah. Why on earth would the Rambam lump together women and slaves? Tell me, what do they have in common? Because they're not the same people. People get offended. Oh, the Rambam puts women with slaves. Why does it? The Rambam has a legal reason why he does this. Very good. Men, uh, women and slaves are exempt from time-bound mitzvot. Mitzvot ase, chazman gama. And therefore, it's kind of like if you would go to... You want to explain? So they're not obligated to mitzvot that are bound by time? You're right, we learned about that on Shabbat recently. So, imagine you would go to... Give me an example of where you would go. To an amusement park, you would go to uh, whatever place you would go. And there are special fees for uh, people under the age of 12, uh, military uh, veterans, and senior citizens. And you say, what on earth do these people all have in common with each other? What do 10-year-olds, people who survived Vietnam, and uh, senior citizens have to do with each other? Nothing, aside from the fact that they only have to pay $5 to get into the amusement park instead of $10 to get to the amusement park. Nobody who wrote the sign was trying to say that children are equal to the sacrifice that war vets gave to us, and nobody's trying to say that senior citizens and children are the same category. It's simply including someone in the same legal category. We have to read Judy's Jewish texts like Jewish people read them. El chiyuv mitzvah zo kachu. The obligation of the mitzvah of prayer is as follows. שיהיה אדם מתחנן ומתפלל בכל יום, that a person must pray and supplicate הקדוש ברוך הוא every day. ומגיל שפחו של הקדוש ברוך הוא, and they must say the praises of הקדוש ברוך הוא. On the top of page 8. ואחר כך שואל צרכה, and only after you've praised הקדוש ברוך הוא, you begin to ask for the things you want. My children, sometimes Saba and Safta come over, and uh, they run, Bubblegum! Where's the bubblegum? Where's the candy? And Safta is correct, and she tells them, my name is not Bubblegum. My name is Safta. Hi, how are you? How am I doing? Afterwards, you could ask me about the candies, but for right now, you have to treat me with the respect that a person deserves when they walk through your front door. You know, when my wife and I got married, I realized there's also a different method of communication in the East Coast and the West Coast. So for example, if I read somebody an email, The first two lines of my email is going to be, Hi, how are you? I hope your family is well. I hope things are doing well. In the East Coast, it's not like that. They just get straight to the point. Why am I wasting my time? You don't care about my family. I don't care about your family. We just want to know what time are you coming to the meeting on Tuesday. That's all we want to know. And so, straight to the point. As per your request, on this, here's the time I'm available. Zeu. 
Chachamim teach us that it's Derech Eretz to communicate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, first by praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and then afterwards asking things from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. ואחר כך שואל צרכיו שהוא צריך להם בבקשה ובתחינה ואחר כך נותן שבח והודיה על השם על הטובה שהשפיע לו and afterwards after you ask for what you want the formula is praise request and then praise again thanking הקדוש ברוך הוא for everything that he has given you until now כל אחד לפי כוחו and every person Praise to HaKadosh Baruch Hu based on their abilities, their strengths, the, what, the, what they're experiencing, how they know how to pray. So if you were to ask, what is the definition of Avodah Shebalev, service of the heart? Avodah Shebalev is prayer. What is the definition of Tefillah, of prayer? It's this. That every person should be able, in their own words, to approach HaKadosh Baruch Hu, To praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu in a truthful fashion. To ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the things they truly need. And then afterwards to have gratitude for HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the things that He has already given us. And everybody prays at the length, with the eloquent language or lack thereof, that they're able to do. Every person prays differently. This is not something that is standardized. And therefore, next halakha the Ramam says, Im hayah agin, if a person was accustomed, they were fluent in Hebrew, or in this process of prayer, it's not just Hebrew, it's the ability to pray properly, then he prays more. And if a person was of slow speech, not meaning that they're literally slow, but they're not eloquent in their language. They pray however much they can. Whenever they can. And everybody prays the amount of prayers that they're able to pray. There are those who pray only once a day. There are those who pray many times a day. You think Chachamim only prayed three times a day? Three times a day is the bare minimum that Chachamim obligated us to pray. But why not pray a hundred times a day? Ten times a day? At least five times a day? Why, why only three? One thing that was consistent was regardless where a person was geographically, they would always pray in the direction of the Ben Mikdash. And this was the uniform custom from Moshe Rabbeinu up until the days of Ezra, where we're dealing with this generation right now. So what did prayer look like before Ezra HaSofer came with Anshei Knesset HaGdona and instituted them, standardized them? The prayer was a very organic, natural, fluid thing. That those who were better at it were better at it, and those who were less versed in how to pray properly, they prayed perhaps whatever minimum they were able to offer up to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but it was truly what we call Avodah Shebalev, service of the heart. Today you have the opposite problem. People pray exactly every single word it says in the Siddur. And you look at their face. I, I cannot forget my childhood of looking at people's faces and seeing them pray. It's almost like part of the way they prayed, aside from erratic shuckling and head bobbing and everything else that came along with prayer, there's also this like, it's like a pained expression. If you haven't seen what I'm talking about, you probably don't know what I'm talking about. It's almost like you're suffering in your tefillah. And I went to myself, is that really tefillah? Is that really tefillah? When I spoke to the elders in Yerushalayim who told me that they remember their grandparents, they would come to the Beda Knesset, everybody would have their own bench or their own pillow on that bench, and they would have a glass of tea that was probably a little too sweet and they should have been drinking at the Beda Knesset. Everybody had a date with a walnut inside or some kind of marzipan that was handed around, and they would have their legs crossed, and they would lean back, and they would sing Bakashot HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and they would also pray their obligatory prayers, but nobody rushed to leave the Beda Knesset. Everybody came early to the Beda Knesset. The rabbi used to stick around to learn Torah with whoever wanted to in the Beda Knesset. Tefillah was something normal, organic, natural, flowing. And we've institutionalized tefillah, and all of a sudden, all of the technical tefillah is there. But Avodah Shebalev has disappeared completely. In fact, if you're going to be one of those emotional people during your tefillah, everybody will look at you like you're crazy. We had one of our mothers like that in the Mishkan. Remember our mother who came to pray in the Mishkan? Who am I talking about? 
Chana. Chana comes to pray. Alatz libi v'adonai. She comes to pray to Kadosh Baruch And what happens, Chana? What does the Kohen Gadol think? Very good. Eli reads the Urim et Tumim backwards, and she thinks that she's drunk. Instead of saying Keshera, that she was kosher, it says that she was Shikora, that she was drunk. And he tells her, why are you praying like this in the Benjamin Dash? You read that in your Navi book? I'm so proud of you, Ochanan. That's in the Navi book. So, you have here a classic situation already of many, many years ago, in which a Jewish woman comes to pray with intention, with Kavanah, and everybody's looking at her like she's a strange bird inside of a bit of Knesset. This is not new. It's not a new problem. Let's continue one more paragraph in the Rambam, in the bottom of page 8. Kevan shegalu Yisrael b'me Nebuchadnezzar harasha. Once the Jewish people were exiled in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, the evil one, nit'arvu b'faras v'yavan. They became intermingled with other cultures like Persia, like Greece. Ushar haumot and other nations, v'noldu lehem banim b'artot ha-goyim. And children were born to them in the countries of the goyim. V'otan ha-banim nit'balbelu sevatam. And those children who were born in foreign countries, their Hebrew, their language became confused. And it became common in Jewish households that along with Hebrew, other languages were mixed into that Hebrew. And when a Jewish person would speak, Jews were no longer speaking one language well, they were speaking confused languages. These Jewish people, they're speaking half Jewish, half Ashdodit. They're, they're confused in their language. And there are some Jews that had Hebrew that was mixed into it foreign languages. And there were other Jews that their language of mixed in Hebrew and foreign languages became their mother language. That became their holy tongue. That's an even more embarrassing development of Jewish history. Now, the chaval that it happened, but then to champion the mistake that it happened, that's already incomprehensible. Umi Pneze, we call this Hebrewish. You, know, you hear people say, uh, they speak half a sentence, it's Hebrew. By the way, today in Israel, this is already a thing. In Israel, Israelis no longer speak Hebrew. Israelis speak English with Israeli accents. So all kinds of words that they borrow that today, for example, how do you say in Hebrew to send somebody a fax message, uh, you know, for a fax, I don't even know who uses faxes, aside from Israel. The word they use is, lefaxes. I'm going to faxes something. Or in Hebrew, when they want to tell, I want to send you a text message, instead of writing, I will send you a message, they write, uh, I will SMS you. It's already become part of the vocabulary. I was once sitting in my aunt's house, in Atlit, my aunt Esther, I should bless her with good health. I was sitting at her home, and she brought out a, a variety of teas, as is classic in a Moroccan home. There's a cup, one cup of water and a hundred boxes of tea. So I'm trying to figure out which of these teas I want to drink, and there was one of them, it really caught my eye. The problem was I'm holding this box and I'm flipping it and has you know, sides to it. I'm trying to see what kind of tea this is. And I'm thinking to myself, either, either my mind is not working properly, there's Hebrew words, I don't know. I'm trying to, yala, yala, I'm trying to, cannot make out the words. Suddenly it comes out to me that this tea says on it in Hebrew, yellow label. That's what it says, which is yellow label. But it took me a long time to figure out that it was an English word written in Hebrew letters. If they would have told me that they would write yellow label in English, I would know exactly what they're talking about. This is, a, this is exactly what the Rambam is talking about. Their language has become, it's funny, their language has become confused. And therefore, because of this, when one of them came to pray, they were unable to properly express themselves and what they needed. Or they were unable to properly praise HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Hebrew. Until ultimately they had to, while they were praying Hebrew, use other words to describe HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now aside from the tragedy of not being able to pray in a fluent Hebrew, there's also, and I'm reading into the Rambam here in my own reading, and I hope that someone else before me said this, so that I'm not relying on myself. There's also the danger of what happens when you start to borrow non-Jewish words 
to describe a Kadosh Baruch Hu. You open up Sidurim and you see the English side of the Sidur, I always say, whatever Sidur, it doesn't matter which Sidur you use. It's the King James half of the Sidur. The omnipotent, the omnipresent, the, the all-knowing, all-powerful, all kinds of crazy words you read over here. You wonder, who, who says that about Kadosh Baruch Hu? Even earlier I used the word supplication. What on earth is a supplication? I only know what a supplication is because I know what the Hebrew word techina is and I know that they translate techina as a supplication. But never in my life have I used the word supplication outside of the context of techina. It would be much better for us to use the Hebrew words that mean what our Chachamim intended for them to mean. And because our rabbis knew this was unreasonable to expect mass fluency of Hebrew, once Ezra and his Bet Adin, they saw this problem, they went and instituted for them 18 blessings al hasedr. Al hasedr is a unique meaning. Anyone know what al hasedr means? I think I know. Yeah? On the, on the order. On the order. What does on the order mean? Very good. That's right. That's the translation of that. Order of what? I should have brought it today. I didn't bring it. There's a piece of Agadah. Chachami mentioned that Paro said one of these blessings, and this said one of these blessings. All of these blessings were said previously in Jewish history, and that Sheikh Nazak Dola in their Ruach HaKodesh were able to bring all of the Berachot that were mentioned previously in Jewish history and put them in proper chronological order and create for us the Amidah. It's a piece of Agadah that is not necessarily relevant for right now, which is why I'm not delving into it. Shalosh Rishonot, the first three blessings, Shevach Lashem, as required by the law, the first three blessings are praised. And the last three are also a thanksgiving blessing. What are the first three? The first three paragraphs, Amida, until Atakadosh. And then from Ritze onwards, those are the three blessings of Hodaya. And the other blessings. So 18 minus the first three and minus the last three brings us to 12. The 12 middle blessings of the Amidah are avot. They are the general categories that every person would need. So that everybody can know them. And they will study them. That those who were unable to pray with proper refined speech will now be able to use a formula which was perfect. And because of this, And this is the reason why Ezra and his Bet Adin went to institute blessings. It wasn't to rid the tefillah of the heart of Avodah Shebalev. It was there to help deal with the problem that people wanted to be able to pray properly. They wanted to know how to properly express themselves. Notice there's a word that Rambam says. He says that these blessings, the intermediary blessings, they're kemo avot. They're like the, the generic categories that everybody would need. They're generic categories for the needs of the individuals and the communities. What does that mean? What do you understand when you hear that? Okay, so that's one part, for sure. The basic chachamim have gotten together all of the main categories of things you want to pray for. Health, uh, forgiveness, uh, needs, uh, agricultural needs, all kinds of things like that. Return to Eretz Yisrael, whatever else. Uh, what else would uh, do you hear from this? Okay, very good. That, Zev uh, said exactly what I wanted to say. You have this question that's brought up. Are we allowed to pray in our own words? Can we in, introduce into the Amidah our own prayers? Our Chachamim say that aside from the first three and the last three, which are standard formulas of praising HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that the middle blessings of the Amidah, what do you mean can you? Can you? You must. You must. Those are only outlines. It's like the, it's the notes. You know, you get a, you're planning to write a book, so you make an outline of the book. But if you don't ever write anything more, then it's just going to stay an outline. Chachamim gave us generic categories. Who here has a complete bill of health in themselves? They never need to pray for health, or they're not worried ever in the future about their health. 
Who here doesn't have anybody in their extended family who needs prayers for health? Or anybody of their friends who needs prayer? So how do you go through a blessing of Rifa'inu and not pray for yourself? And not pray for the things that are uniquely bothering you? The things that the rest of your family needs? Parnasah. What is anybody here who works in the same field of Parnasah as somebody else? How can you get away with a generic blessing of Parnasah without praying for your unique needs of Parnasah? Some people are dependent on clients to make a panaza. Some people are dependent on economies to make a panaza. Some people are dependent on the stock market to make a panaza. Sometimes all of those things are connected together to make a panaza. Sometimes people are hopeless in getting a panaza. Rabbi Ben Ezra always said that if he were, the legend says about him, that he never succeeded in business, and that if he were to open up a funeral home, people would just stop dying. That's what would be his mazal. He never had any luck uh, with, his, with his business. Uh, whether it's true or not, the legend is still a good one. And this exact problem that our Chachamim tried to solve has now created a new problem of people who don't know how to individualize their standardized prayers. I had a rabbi in Yeshiva when I was in Baltimore, so I'm telling you something about Baltimore. He was my rabbi in 10th grade. And now I'm not exaggerating, because there's nothing, not one thing I'm telling you an exaggeration. We would pray every morning at 7.30 in the morning. And these uh, Lithuanians, they, they are on a clock, so nothing happens not on a clock. At 7.55 is exactly when they begin the Amidah. Somewhere around 8.04 or 8.05 is when they begin the repetition of the Amidah. Shachrit ends closer to 8.30. If it's a Torah reading day, 8.45. We would have classes then around 9.30 in the morning. My rabbi in 10th grade, who he used to start his Amidah at 7.55, when it was 9.27 before our class started, he would take his three steps back for his Amidah, and he would come to the classroom and take off his tefillin as he was preparing to teach our 9.30 class. In 10th grade, I had an example of what is a person who can pray Amidah for one hour and a half. Now, is there any expectation that any of us should pray Amidah for an hour and a half? No, that's not the message of this story. For many of us, praying Amidah for an hour and a half would be highly impractical, or it would be, it would be fake of us. It wouldn't be genuine of us. What it does teach you, though, is I'm certain that this rabbi who knew how to read Hebrew and translate Hebrew and write Hebrew was not stuck trying to pronounce all the words. Rather, he was teaching his Talmudim that prayer is so personal that you can be immersed in it for an hour and a half. I recall when the Kalav Rebbe, when I used to pray with him, should live and be well, Hashem should bless him with health, at the end of his Amidah, he would take his talit and throw it over his whole body so he would wrap himself, you wouldn't see him. And he could stand there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, just alone, alone. Just praying for whatever he needs to pray for. Why is this so unusual today? Sometimes you go to a minyan, you go pray in a place, and you're, you're rushing, you're, you're losing your breath to catch up the Amidah by the time the Chazan is done. You don't even have time to think about the words you're saying, let alone to add anything of your own to Tifilah. Who created this type of Tifilah? And who's fooling themselves that this Tifilah has anything to do with what Anshay Knesset and Dolah were, Anshay Knesset and Dolah were trying to fix a problem. The heart was there, but the words were not there. So they gave us the words, but we didn't take the words on account of getting rid of the heart. That wasn't the purpose of Mashiach Nezadullah. But for today, I want to wrap up just one more note. And that is that there is an entirely different purpose that has been suggested that Anshay Knesset and Dolah made this Takana. And this will set the theme for all of the Takana that we will talk about in the coming Shiuli. This first Takana of instituting prayers that every person could memorize, that every person could know, that every person would know how to pronounce properly, has a much deeper message than just standardizing tefillah. Do you remember what we talked about yesterday? Why was there a transition of leadership between the Kohanim into the Chachamim? Why did we skip that generation of Kohanim and go straight from the Nevi'im to the Chachamim? What's the reason that we gave yesterday? What did Malachi say? He was accusing the Kohanim of What is he? Very good. He was accusing the Kohanim of corruption. If you look on, on page 6, Malachi says in chapter 2, Pazuk 8, and you, min you Kohanim have deviated from the press. You have made many stumble through your teachings of Torah. You have corrupted the covenant that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made with the Nevi'im. Amar Adonai Tzivot, says HaKadosh Baruch Hu. 
the Kohanim are accused of being corrupt leadership. You have to understand that until today, until today, what does the Ramam tell us? How does a Jew pray? A Jew prays in their own words. In which direction do they pray? To the Mikdash. Wherever they are, to the Mikdash. Correct? If you really want to have an intense prayer, you go to the Bet Mikdash. You want to get Berkat Kohanim, you go to the Bet Mikdash. You want to offer a sacrifice, you go to the Bet Mikdash. Everything revolves around the Kohanim and the Bet Mikdash. Along come the Anshei Knesset Agdala, and they say, how can we let people have their lives centered around something that is so corrupt? Something that is so problematic. We must decentralize religion in Am Yisrael. It sounds like chaos, and it's exactly what happens. Ezra HaSofer not just gives permission for this chaos, but he leads this movement of chaos. And more than he leads this movement of chaos, Ezra HaSofer has one last reason. I was once watching a beautiful piece of Chazanut in a denomination of Judaism that I normally wouldn't pray of. A beautiful piece of Chazanut. And here I'm seeing an auditorium full of maybe 2,000 people praying. But it's 2,000 people who are in, sitting in complete silence. And there's one chazan with a microphone who is leading the most heart-wrenching version of a tefillah. And what are 2,000 people doing? They're watching. They're watching. But many people are used to this type of tefillah. It doesn't have to be in other denominations. I think one of the hallmarks of a Sephardic minyan is that you get into a room and everybody prays together. Most of the tefillah is out loud. You come to Kabbalah Shabbat, you don't hear the first pasuk and the last pasuk of every paragraph. It's a whole tefillah. We're singing together. The chazan is there to help us get through the tefillah, but he's not a cantor. He's not somebody you're listening to a concert of. Even the Namidah of Yom Kippurim, Oshana. There are putim that we pass around, things that we pass around to each other. Adonai, shamati shimacha yareti, Adonai. We're praying to get everyone is involved in this tefillah. Shir Hashirim. The whole room gets involved in Shir Hashirim. There's no cantor. My wife once said that those who can sing are singers and those who can't are cantors. And this is a certain mentality in Ami Sayyid. You go to a show. The Bede Knesset is a performance. There actually have been researchers who have studied why the sermon was such a big deal in, in the world of yesterday. Not just in the Christian churches, but also in the Jewish synagogues in the Lower East Side of a hundred years ago. Why did Jews gather in mass to these? You know how long those derashot were? Sometimes the, the rabbi's speech was an hour and a half, two hours long. He would spend days preparing that sermon. What was so special? What was so special about that sermon? It was special that nobody had a TV at home. The movie theater cost money. The opera houses cost money. You get your entertainment in your house of worship. There's a singer, there's sometimes even a band, and there's a person who speaks, an animated speech with stories and jokes and riddles and all kinds of politics, whatever they speak about. That's entertainment of two hours on a Sunday morning, on a Shabbat morning. And as soon as people don't need that anymore, so then in the words of the Paitanim, Father Mackenzie is writing a sermon that no one will hear. Nobody's going to hear it because nobody's listening. Nobody cares anymore. The rabbi's derasha goes from being two hours long to I was once in a Bera Knesset and they told me, go, you have 90 seconds. 90 seconds? What are they going to say in 90 seconds? Dushi's parasha is Shabbat Shalom, thank you to the sisterhood. What are you going to say in 90 seconds? It's not normal. So why bother speaking in the first place? People have a, a Twitter attention span when it comes to derashot. They can do 160 characters or less. That's what they can handle. By the way, I once made that joke and someone showed me a book of a rabbi, I'm not denigrating the book, who wrote a book of divrei Torah, 160 characters or less in the weekly parasha, which tells you that the attention span of your average uh, person is 160 characters or less, which is a, a devastating reality to live in. Chachamim si. That the Jewish people have turned the Benjamin Dash into the place where other people pray for me, other people worship for me, other people study Torah for me. I don't have to do anything. I'm disconnected. If I don't know how to pray, big deal, there's someone in Jerusalem who prays for me. I don't know how to say Kaddish, I'll pay the rabbi to say Kaddish. One of my friends once wrote 
You know, the first rabbi in America who took $10 to say Kaddish for somebody else is single-handedly responsible for ruining the rabbinate in America. How hard is it to learn how to say Kaddish? How hard is it to show up on Shabbat to say Kaddish once a week? Why delegate Judaism to other people? Ezra HaSofer comes around and says, I'm not a Kohen anymore. Now I'm a Sofer. I may be the Kohen Gadol. And even though I am responsible for the Ben Mikdash, I'm decentralizing Judaism. I'm making sure that every home is its own Ben Mikdash. That every Ben Knesset is a Mikdash Me'at, is a miniature Ben Mikdash. That every person knows how to pray. That every person says blessings before they eat food. That every person knows how to pray three times a day, and at which time of the day, and exactly which words they need to say at the very minimum. And what we might see as an over-standardization of tefillah, is Zaha Sofel was leading a revolution that creates the Judaism that we have today. To the point where when a Christian missionary comes over to us, and says, oh, the book of Leviticus, it's all about blood and sacrifices, and where is the blood that you need, the blood of this one and that one, and you tell I don't know what you're talking about. Because maybe a Jew 2,000 years ago would understand the need for a Bede Mikdash with sacrifices. And we all want the Bede Mikdash, not necessarily the way that the Bede Mikdash used to look but a glorious Ben Mikdash of the future. Nonetheless, we all are able to hold our own. We know how to pray. We know how to learn. We know how to engage our families in Tuam Mitzvot. We know how to engage our communities in Tuam Mitzvot. And essentially, as I mentioned to you on Chanukah, this is the story of Chanukah. When leadership becomes corrupt, when the Ben Mikdash is taken away, the Jewish people always have their own miniature Ben Mikdash to retreat to. They always go back home. It's exactly why we don't need to light a Chanukian, the Bera Knesset per se. Because that's not the point. The point is about reclaiming the Jewish family's individual Judaism. And if anything, Ezra Sofer was not trying to take away the individuality from the Jewish people, but he was trying to restore that power. He was empowering the Jewish people to take their Jewish destiny into their own hands. And now with this context in mind, the next Shirim that we have together, in which we discuss Ezra Sofer, which we discuss all of the things that he did, you're now going to be able to see that this is exactly the theme that Ezra Sofer was trying to bring to the Jewish people. Perhaps I can do with you one more piece. It's okay with you? One more takana of Ezra Sofer. Our Chachamim tell us something unusual. So look here on page 9 at the bottom of the page. Asara takanot tiken Ezra. Ezra HaSofer made ten decrees. What are the decrees? Shekorin b'milcha b'shabbat. That we read the Torah in the afternoon of Shabbat. Vekorin b'sheni v'chamishi. We read on the Monday and Thursday. We read the Torah. By the way, some say that this is a, a takana already from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. But just that the Jewish people fell out of, it fell out of, uh, uh, practice in Am Yisrael. And Ezra came and renewed this. In general, you're going to see a theme that our rabbis compare Ezra Sofer with Moshe Rabbeinu. And many of the things that Moshe Rabbeinu did, Ezra kind of came and did again. Vidanin b'sheni v'chamishi. And they set up Batei Din on Mondays and Thursdays. What's so special about Monday and Thursday? Anybody know? Yeah, why? Why? What's ha- what happens on Monday and Thursday? Yemeshuk, very good. These are market days. These are days where all the people from the villages come to the city. They're going to shop. You shop on Monday for the week and on Thursday for Shabbat. So our rabbis took advantage of the fact that even the Jews from remote places were coming together. That's why if you look at Masech and Megillah, there are days in which you read the Megillah even before Purim, because those are the days in which the people of the villages are gathered in the cities where you have literate people that can read to them the Megillah. And they do laundry on Thursday. The Ben Ishchai was very particular not to do laundry on Friday because there's a takana of Ezra to do laundry on Thursday. Why on Thursday? Very good. So that's, that's one of the reasons you might end up doing laundry, parts of laundry, drying, clothes, whatever it would be. On Shabbat, that would be a problem. Even just the fact that you need time to prepare for Shabbat. You can't cook for Shabbat on Thursday. Why? You don't have a refrigerator. Food doesn't last. You have to cook on Friday. But things like laundry, you can fold your clothes and leave them in your closet from Thursday. And therefore our Chachamim, one of the decrees they made was they standardized laundry day. Thursday is the day 
in which Chachamim instituted that we do laundry. Shabbat, and they eat garlic on Friday evening. That's connected to the mitzvah of having children. That a woman should wake up early in the morning and bake bread. That has to do with baking bread for Shabbat. This was an interesting standard of tzniyut that had to do with wearing some sort of apron for a woman. The whole in concept of chafifa as it relates to the laws of family purity was instituted by Islam's bet din and that the peddlers should travel through the different villages or the cities. Why should the peddlers travel through the cities? Why is that a takana of his last? What is, he, what is the purpose of having peddlers, traveling merchants? When you have set businesses that sell things at a set price, they have taxes, they have to pay rent, they have to pay so on and so forth, they have a certain price that they have to sell things at. They have a monopoly also over controlling the market. These peddlers are somewhat rebellious. They don't have to pay rent. They don't pay taxes, local taxes at least, because they're not part of the local. They're, they're hit and run. They come through, they sell, they leave. Islam Sofel wanted to make sure that in a business sense, certain people wouldn't have monopoly over the economy that other people wouldn't have an access to. And therefore, they made sure to, to make products, basic necessities, accessible to the people. What else? And also he made tevila, not just for women, but also for men who experience any kind of emissions. Most of these takanot are not entirely relevant to us, but there is one of these takanot that is very relevant to us. And that is the takana of reading the Torah. Reading the Torah of Mincha, and reading the Torah of Monday and Thursday. When his last of comes, if you look in the book of Nehemiah, I think it's chapter 2, I think so. Uh, it could be chapter 8, but I'm, my mind is not with it right now. You look and Ezra comes to Am Yisrael and he sees that these are people that don't know the Torah at all. The Torah is lost to them. They have no understanding of what's written inside of the Torah. In fact, I think I even brought you Pesukim here. One moment. Yeah, look here. Um, on page 13. Let's read in English. On the first day of the seventh month, this was page 14. On the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the teaching, meaning the Torah, before the congregation, men and women and all who could listen with understanding. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from the first light until midday, to the men and the women and those who could understand. The ears of all the people were given to the scroll of the Torah. Ezra the Sofer stood up upon a wooden tower made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matitya, Shema, Anaya, Uriah, Chilkiya, Masiya, at his right and his left. Okay. As I opened the scroll in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood up. So interesting, this is reminiscent of a minhag that we do today. What's that minhag? Very good. Hey, reading the Torah, we lift the Torah, we do Hagbat the Torah. It seems that Ezra is doing something similar. Is that blessed Hashem, the great God? And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, with hands upraised. Then they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before Hashem with their faces to the ground. Like I mentioned recently on Shabbat, that that's the Jewish custom. We bow down on the ground. That's what Jews do. And the Levi'im explained the Torah to the people while the people stood in their places. They read from the scroll of the teaching of Hashem, translating it and giving the sense so they understood the reading. Essentially, Israel Sofer is reintroducing the Torah to a group of Jews who really are out of touch with the Torah. They haven't had access to the Torah. How does this happen? Most likely you're dealing with a camp of overzealous Kohanim. The Kohanim are tasked with teaching the Torah. And just like anybody else who's been entrusted to preserve a treasure, what do they do? They take very good care of it. How do they take very, very good care of it? They make sure that not everybody has access to it. If everybody touches it and everybody uses it, then it's going to fall apart. And somehow the Kohanim, in a misguided zealotry for the Torah, ended up keeping the Torah for themselves. If it's reminiscent to any other period in Jewish history, you can imagine hearing of the Hasidim and their, their attacks on the, the Mitanagdim of keeping the Torah for only the upper classes of Jews. Whether that narrative is accurate or not is not relevant to this conversation. But the fact that there is such a narrative is important. 
the need to bring the Torah back to the people from the ivory tower in which it has been kept in. Essentially, you're dealing with the Jewish people who the Torah has been kept away from them some in some misguided way to protect the Torah. But what has happened is by protecting the Torah, we have undermined the Jewish people. And you have a Jewish people that are entirely illiterate of the Torah. They're not familiar with the Torah itself. Our generation is not so far away. I'm not talking about the Jews who are outside of the Ben I'm talking about the Jews who are inside of the Jewish community. I would think that for the vast majority of them, if you would make a list of 20 halachot that are written inside of the Shulchan Aruch, they would have no idea what you're talking about. You would say, name the rabbi who said the following quote. And they would tell you, who was that? Was that a... They would never know. Haman, did Haman say, Paro said that? They would never know. Because it goes against everything that they were told in their illiterate understanding of Judaism. Ezra HaSofer decides the Torah must be read regularly on Mondays, on Thursdays, Shabbat afternoon. We are going to be teaching the Torah everywhere to promote Jewish literacy. There is a concept that is very strong in the Ashkenazi Jewish community. And this is the concept of Yiridat HaDorot, the decline of the generations. This idea is very powerful because it allows a generation older than the current generation to always have complete authority uh, over the current Jewish times. And people get guilted and oh, look at you, the generation ago. We would have never done that. All the Jews to keep Shabbat and the shtetl was so great. And look at you people over here in New York. You don't do this. And you look at the shtetl and you say, do you know how many, you know that in Radin, when the Chavetz Chaim was alive, there was a bus line for Jews on Shabbat because the majority of the Jews in the Chavetz Chaim's town didn't even keep Shabbat. They tell you that in Yeshiva when you heard all about the shtetl. They tell you about the, the Bet Yaakov movement and Sarah Schneer who was busy saving Jewish girls, not from the Haskalah. From, she was busy saving Jewish girls from other Jews who were selling their children. Very good. It's a romanticization of the past. And it's very dangerous. Ezra HaSofer is coming to give an understanding. Everyone needs access to Torah. This romanticization of the Jewish people, especially the times of the first Bet Mikdash, it existed in the generation of Ezra also. You hear very often rabbis quote the following teaching of the Talmud. I want to read it to you. And that's, for this we'll end our shiur tonight. Um, the Gemara says the following. On page 10. And it shall come to pass on that day, his burden shall be taken from on your shoulder and his yoke from on your neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed due to fatness, due to shaman. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha. Rabbi Yitzchak Nafcha said, Napacha, that's what they have translated. The yoke of Sancheriv was destroyed by the oil of Chizkiyahu that would burn in the Batei Knesset and the Batei Midrash when the Jews were studying Torah all night long. Masa, how did Chizkiyahu make a generation of Jews who learned Torah? Nobody was democratic about this. Na'atz cherev al petach bet midrash Chizkiyahu put a sword at the entrance of the Batei Midrash. Vamar and he said, Kol osek batorah, Anybody who doesn't learn Torah, this sword is going to take care of them. Badku midan v'ad Bershava, v'lo matzu am ha'aretz. They checked from Dan until Bershava, and they did not find one am ha'aretz. V'lo matzu tinok v'tinoket, and they didn't find a little boy or a little girl, ish v'isha, a man or a woman, shelo hayu bikiin bilchotum avatara. They were not experts in the laws of purity, and impurity, which as you know is a very intricate area of halakha. And on page 11, that generation it says in Yeshayahu, and it shall come to pass on that day that a man shall nourish a young calf and two sheep. And it says, and it shall come to pass on that day that every place where there were 1,000 vines for 1,000 silver coins, that shall be for briars and thorns. This is a beautiful time in a generation of Chizkiyahu HaMelech. In fact, there's even a Sephardic piyut that says, I yearn for those days of Chizkiyahu HaMelech. So what was it? Did the Jewish people forget the Torah in the first Ben Mikdash? Or were the Jewish people studying Torah all night and all day? I think the answer is both. Chizkiyahu's generation of Torah literacy was exactly that. It was Chizkiyahu's generation. It was so special because it was the exception to the rule of the first Ben Mikdash. That's what it was. Ezra HaSofer is now coming with a much less temporary solution. It's not a sword at the entrance of the Ben Mikdash. 
It's instituting decrees. It's making sure the Torah is accessible to the people. Bezrat Hashem, next week, we're going to be discussing the next step of Ezra's Takanot. That in which he takes the text of the Torah and changes the Hebrew alphabet from the Jewish alphabet to a non-Jewish alphabet, which we use today, in order to make the Torah accessible to all the Jewish people. For right now though, before we get carried away in that conversation, which will be for next week, I wish to point out that this type of leadership of Zara Sofer was one that says, the Torah is not afraid of people. The people need the Torah. The people need Torah like a thirsty person needs water, like a hungry person needs food. Am Yisrael without a Torah leads to disaster. Corrupt leadership needs to be replaced. What is the definition of corrupt leadership? I learned from here that the definition of corrupt leadership is a generation of, of leaders who do not trust their own people. A generation of leaders which does not trust its own people is a generation that's not worthy of leading people. Someone called me this week and had a conversation with me about kashrut in the communities and I said, yeah, I want to tell you something. There's something I told my community before we took a break here for COVID and we had to close down the Bidak Knesset. I said, I feel very lucky to be the rabbi of Akilah in which every single family in my Bidak Knesset will eat food in another family's house in the Bidak Knesset. There's not one family here that won't eat by another family. And I said, but a second thing hit me. And the second thing is I might be in a community I'm lucky to be in a community in which I will eat food in every single member's home in my kila. By the way, even those who don't necessarily keep kasher, I've eaten in their home too. When I come to their house, they know Torah well. They care about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What they do for me to make sure that I get in their home, nobody would do that for you. How dare you lead people? So I was talking once to a person who told me that the rabbi would come every Friday to their house to collect a check. And what the rabbi would do when his mother, who was a Persian Jew, who for sure kept kashrut, even if she wasn't observant of halakha elsewhere, the Persian Jews, chazakah, and him, they eat kosher food. What the rabbi would do is he would, they would bring him, he said, only fruits, they would bring him an orange, a sealed orange, and a ceramic plate. And the rabbi wouldn't let the orange touch the plate. I don't know, it was shomer negiaf in the plate. I don't know exactly what happened. He would put the orange on his hand, and he would peel the, the orange on his hand, and put the peels on the plate, and he would eat the orange out of his hand. That aside from this Middle Eastern family, this guy looked like a monkey eating from his hand. Aside from that, it was disrespectful. What do you think we put in that plate? I'm thinking as a, as a rabbi, don't you know the halakha that a cold orange can have nothing, even if that plate was used for a pig, nothing would happen with that plate? How dare you come and fundraise from somebody who you don't consider Jewish enough to feed you an orange that's not kosher for you? How dare you? What kind of leadership is that? And the flip side of that, when Jewish people see that my leadership doesn't trust me, that my leadership won't tell me what's mutar, is really mutar, they won't tell me, everything is just asur, everything is forbidden, they'll never be honest with me about my Jewish faith. What do you think happens? Do you think Jews love you and Torah because of that? Ultimately what happens is you create a distrust. Everything the Chachamim say, the Jewish people don't believe. And what do you think is going to happen after that? What Ezra worked so hard for, to bring the Torah back to the people, to give people access to the Torah. Torah tzivalanu Moshe, Morasha Kilat Yaakov is a Torah that belongs to all of us. What Ezra Sofer works so hard to do, we have so quickly undermined and flipped over on its face. And it's our job, and especially that this is the reason why I'm dedicating so many shiurim to this topic. Unless we can truly appreciate Anshe Kenesta Gedona for the revolution that they brought to Judaism that was needed, we will never truly understand how to fix the problems in our current generation today. The world needs a new Anshei Knesset HaGdona. They said three things. I'll end off today with this teaching. I once saw in the writings of the Lubavitch Rebbe Adam Shalom. He has a commentary in Pekhi Avot. And he says, The Anshei Knesset said three things. Three things, it's a redundant statement. They are right now going to say three things. Why do you have to say, they said three things and these three things are? What does it mean when it says, they said three things? He suggests that these Chachamim were a new breed of Chachamim. That they took three things into consideration. Not just the Torah and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's when most Chachamim, what does Hashem want? What does the Torah say? And these Chachamim taught, there's another element you have to take into consideration. The Torah, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the Jewish people who have to follow the Torah and They said three things, meaning when you come to learn halakha, when you come to teach Torah, you must teach a Torah, you must teach a halakha that is true to that resonates with what is written in the Torah, 
but the Jewish people, what is palatable for them, what they can handle, something they can do. It's for that reason that when you find that Ezra HaSofel makes decrees, then those decrees fall out of popularity in the Jewish people. Why? It's impossible to decree a decree in the community that the community cannot uphold. There's a calculation now. Brought into the equation is, what can the Jewish people handle? And when you live in a Jewish world, in which most of Jewish leadership is out of touch with the day-to-day life that every regular Jewish person lives, you're living in a scary place. Because Hema Mosh Lashad Varim. There's three things that we have to take into consideration. So much so that it led the Zohar and whoever was the author of the Zohar to say, Yisrael, the Oraita, the Kudashah Barichu, the Jewish people, the Torah, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Chad Hu. It's one being, it's one entity. You cannot have a Torah and HaKadosh Baruch Hu if the Jewish people can't get behind that. And you need a leadership that knows how to bring the Torah to the people without compromising on the divinity of the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That sounds like a balancing act. It's a very difficult one. So not everybody has to sign up to be part of the Sheikh Nesla Gedolah. But those who did sign up, they have a job to make sure that the Torah remains the possession of Am Yisrael for eternity. Bezat Hashem, Hashem should allow us to merit to see our children and our children's children. Oskim, Batorah, Mitzvot, they should all be involved in Torah, Mitzvot, and everything that is good for Am Yisrael.